All right. Uh, hello again and welcome. Today we'll be talking about ways to leverage the power of remote sensing to increase your profitability and take your drone service provider business to the next level. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping things. If you have any questions, uh, please ask them in the chat box and we'll answer them at the end. We'll also send out a recording of this webinar so you can keep it for reference or share it with colleagues later on. Um, agricultural drones are transforming how crops are managed around the world. These low-flying, low-cost systems are able to create valuable new types of information that haven't been possible until now. They can be used virtually anywhere at any time for near instantaneous information, which creates a huge opportunity for drone service providers. And before I introduce our experts, uh, let's do a quick poll to learn a little bit more about all of you joining us today. Today, we'll cover uh, understanding your client's needs, the foundation of data value, and how to choose the right tools, before bringing it all together with a real-world case study on how one drone service provider was able to save a client nearly $16 per acre. And our experts today are uh, Mike Ritter, the CEO of Slant Range, and Forrest Baldwin, who's the president and chief pilot of AeroInfo. Um, Forrest had a last minute commitment, so he'll be joining us a little bit late. So I just wanted to bring that up in advance. And before I turn it over to Mike, we'll just quick uh, show you the results of the poll. So for who we have in the audience, it looks like it's mostly drone service providers today with a few people who are uh, distributors, mm -hmm. agronomists, farmers, researchers, and other. Okay, thanks, Shayla, for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Mike Ritter. I'm the CEO of Slant Range. Um, thanks again, everybody, for taking some time out of your day to, to join us. Uh, before I before I jump in, I, I wanted to say that uh, part of the motivation for us doing this today um, is we've seen a lot of uh, interaction in online communities amongst uh, drone service providers, people sharing best practices, tips with each other, um, and we've seen a lot of good ideas going back and forth. And we thought, you know what? Uh, we we talk to a lot of uh, drone service providers ourselves. Obviously, <clears throat> uh, we've uh, you know interacted with hundreds over the last several years, operating on on six, six different continents and dozens of different crop types. Uh, we see that the uh, the issues, the questions that come up every day, and that's that's part of our, our daily thing. So, what we wanted to do is just have a a, a real brief uh, kind of high level discussion on some of the best practices that that we see. Uh, in the industry space and, and share that with, uh, with all of you uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a general sense. Um, so the, what, what we've outlined here, and again, this is only a 30-minute webinar, so we're, we're keeping it high level, but uh, what we wanted to I do is just outline kind of a couple of high-level rules of thumb that we see, uh, you know, best uh, practices in the industry space. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of people be very successful in this business. We've seen some not be so successful. Um, and we've, uh, over time, learned some things, uh, despite what crop you may be operating in. Uh, and we, we recognize there's a huge diversity of, of applications out there, uh, and, and everybody's got their unique challenges. But there are a couple of common rules of thumb that we think that would uh, really value uh, everybody. So uh, let, me, let me jump in. Uh, the first key point um, that we, what we make to everybody is, first, the most important thing you can do is, is to understand your client's needs. Uh, what this means is, I mean, ultimately, as a drone service provider, you are the bridge between the technology and ultimately answering uh, a problem uh, that, a, that a grower may have or an agronomist may have at, at the end of the day. So um, and a critical element, I think, that uh, you know, some of our mo most successful DSP partners have understood is that when they're able to deeply understand what their client's needs are, uh, they're able to deliver uh, the best service, and uh, you know that that means you know really trying to understand what their operations are, what are their day-to-day -day challenges. Um, but uh, to put a little bit more framework on this, what we wanted to do is, is share with you uh, well framework that we developed and we we kind of we share all all the time. Um, but recognize that you know any farming operation, at least every farming operation that we've seen provided the right information can make an improvement to its operations. And ultimately what it comes down to 
is, is you as a, a service provider identifying what those information needs are uh, and ultimately seeing if you can deliver them with the technology tools that you that you have. And I think that uh, the most successful DSPs that we've worked with are, are really adept at doing that and, and being flexible with the technology application uh, to, to meet their client needs. Um, so we developed a, a framework, and I'll throw it up here briefly, and I, we don't have time to go into a lot of detail on this, but I, hopefully this will provide a little bit of framework for trying to diagnose you know, what is actually valuable uh, in terms of information that you, you deliver to a grower. Now, ultimately, uh, for the information you deliver to, to a grower or to an agronomist to have value, it has to be two things. One, it has to be actionable, and it, two, it has to be available at, at the time and the place that they, they need it to actually enact the decision. So, for example, um, if you get an NDVI map from a satellite, and it's, it's lagging by a week of uh, when, when the actual image was taken, uh, and maybe it wasn't collected at the resolution you need to actually distinguish between a thin crop and something maybe it's affected by a pest condition, that's not very actionable information. If, it, you know, if the information doesn't get to the, uh, to the farmer when they need it. Um, human scouts, on the other hand, are, are very adept at uh, delivering actionable information, but they're so sparse that the availability is low. So on the other end of the scale, um, availability it speaks to the cost, the time, and the place, and the availability of information. So this is a high-level framework that we apply to say that, you know, when you look at a grower's problem and your ability to deliver valuable information to it, kind of apply these, these quick questions in your, in your mind. You know, if, if I deliver this information, is it actually going to be uh, actionable by the grower, uh, and can I deliver it fast enough uh, so, so that they can really do something with it? Now, one thing I did want to add uh, with regard to this chart is that the, the low altitude drone is really unique amongst all these uh, alternatives that you see in the chart in the sense that uh, they can deliver much more actionable data uh, and they can do it virtually anywhere, anytime, uh, uh, which makes them really uh, high on the availability scale. So as technology continues to develop, what we see is the low altitude drone moving to the high, uh, the upper right part of this chart, which is really the high value uh, area, whereas the other options you see here are kind of stuck where they are for, for a number of reasons. But to get a little bit more specific, uh, let's look at some, some quick applications here. Um, uh, so when we first got started, uh, we, we were looking in uh, corn uh, crops particularly, we were talking to breeders and we said, you know, forget what you might think about uh, remote sensing technology, whether it's from a satellite or a manned aircraft or even from a drone, and just tell us what you'd like to know about your fields that you don't know today. Uh, and what we've heard from a lot of corn growers, especially from breeders, is if we could get a count of the plants in the field and we could get, a, you know, an estimate of their size during these critical early stage uh, development, uh, that would be really valuable information for us. So uh, we uh, worked with uh, our, our uh, DSP partners and we work with growers to kind of come up with a tool to do that uh, and now that's that's an, an available capability and a lot of people are using it. Another example, uh, we have a, a Latin American partner who came to us and said, you know, what we're really interested in doing is counting individual pineapple fruit in a field and measuring their size and the combination of the, the fruit count and their size will give us an estimate of what the yield is. So. Uh, you know what, counting corn plants and counting pineapple plants are actually not that uh, dissimilar from a technology point of view. So we adapted the algorithms and were able to, to solve that particular problem. Similarly, uh, in, in the Central California uh, region, uh, there's a lot of lettuce growers. And what's particularly of value to them? Same thing, counting and sizing individual lettuce heads, which gives them an estimate of, of yield. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the grower had an extensive weed problem, and the question came down to, is it worth paying a harvesting team to go out actually and harvest this field uh, given the weed, uh, the weed growth? And we were able to uh, produce this information to say that, you know, this is your estimated yield and they ultimately decided, you know, it's, it's probably not worth the time to, to pay a harvesting team. Some other examples. We have uh, partners, uh, DSV partners working in the insurance area who were uh, wondering if they can quantify the amount of crop damage from, from wind events, particularly lodging uh, and green snap. So what, uh, what has been developed is a, a tool that allows the, you know, the user to train the software to detect those types of events. And uh, you can see that in the blue areas in, in the chart, of, in the, uh, the picture in the upper left, uh, indicating lodged plant regions. 
a similar application in California, water uh, is particularly valuable to growers, it's very expensive. So uh, anything that's causing uh, uh, problems with irrigation is, is a particular problem. Uh, in this particular case, again, the user was able to train the software using a special signals technique that's built into the software to find uh, soil moisture conditions that are above a certain threshold. And here you can see the blue regions uh, uh, where the, that the uh, soil moisture exceeded that particular, that particular threshold. And then another example, using a similar signals training technique, uh, a watermelon grower in Florida was able to uh, detect weed growth. So my point in showing these examples is that uh, if, if you think going door to door selling NDVI maps is going to build a DV, NDVI or build a, a drone service provider business, um, you, you, you really got to go a little step further, which is to identify these types of problems that growers have. Uh, and, and then ultimately, uh, you as a service provider is the bridge again between what technology can provide uh, and, and, and adapting that technology uh, through your own practices to, to solving these real, real world problems. So moving to step, uh, you know, um, kind of rule of thumb net number two is once you've understood the needs of your growers, your clients, you have to choose your tools based on those on those data needs. So to dig into that in a little bit more detail, um, ultimately when you're choosing your technology, it really comes down to two things. One, is it going to deliver the data you actually need to build a business with? And then two, uh, assuming that's the case, how efficiently can you go out and operate this uh, system or this technology? So obviously as a, as a service provider, you wanna keep your costs down. So um, on along those lines, <clears throat> again, uh, will, will the products deliver the data you need? Uh, two, a, an important aspect of this is around trust. And uh, you know, if, if, uh, if the data can't be trusted, it's, it's not really actionable. So again, uh, when it comes to data trust, when we're, what we're talking about here is um, is your system calibrated? Uh, is the performance reliable? So when, if it's not calibrated, you may not be able to track performance over time. You may not be able to compare today's data to, to last week's data. And that, that uh, with, uh, takes back some of the value of the overall system. And then another important thing around reliability is can you actually track the performance of the system while it's in the air? Um, more advanced systems now are actually getting a lot more data to the operator while they're on the ground and they know that they're getting the data that they need. Third key point is around scalability. So assuming you're successful in, in capturing initial clients and you really start to grow, uh, you need to um, ask yourself, you know, well, how are my costs going to grow? How can I scale this? And what this comes down to is, you know, if you have to pay on a per acre basis to get your data processed, that's something that you might want to factor in. Um, a key point for a lot of people who are operating in regions that don't have great uh, network uh, access, can you process and produce all your data products offline? Uh, or do you have to be connected to a cloud connection to actually to do, to do your processing? That's a, that's a key piece in being able to scale in the regions that don't have good internet access. Another key question is, is the technology advancing? Uh, you know, a lot of these technologies are, are, are moving quickly, um, and will those new uh, advances be available to you after you invest in your equipment? That's a key question. Finally, total cost of ownership is, is a key one. And, and, and I think a lot of people, uh, you know, will make a, especially around the first purchase, uh, make a decision based on initial sticker price. And what we can't emphasize enough is to really look at the total cost of ownership because I think what a lot of uh, DSPs realize is that uh, your time uh, is probably the most uh, costly uh, item in your entire, entire endeavor. And the more time you spend either collecting data or processing data, that's really going to drive the cost of your business, uh, not necessarily the cost of the equipment up front. So finally, the last key point here is, um, you know, assuming you've identified the need to be grower, assuming uh, that you've invested in, in the right technology to solve those particular needs, uh, it comes down to actually, you know, you really got to learn how to use, use the technology. Um, uh, in, today's, in today's day and age, we're, we're accustomed uh, to, you know, press a button and you get the result you want. Um, and we're con as, as technology suppliers ourselves, we're continually working uh, to, to meet that type of uh, uh, hurdle. However, what we've seen is the most successful DSPs uh, that we work with are the ones who really understand the technology, they understand, they understand the needs of their, their clients, and they're able to bridge that gap with uh, you know, flexible uh, use of the technology. And by all means, 
if you have a unique application that you think is, has got a lot of value to it, talk to us about it because uh, you know it's something we might do, want to build into our into our own tool. So, uh, with all that said, we're going to start tr transitioning now. We see Forrest Baldwin. He's one of our uh, most successful drone service providers. He's based in Texas. Uh, he's going to share a really cool story with us um, uh, from a from a South Texas sorghum or or Milo field. Uh, before we do that, I think we have one more poll question. I'll ask Shayla to put that up. And then we can uh, introduce uh, Forrest's uh, case study. We do. That brings us to our second poll question that you should see uh, now live on your screen. Okay, so the poll question here, just real quickly, uh, of all these different types of data, you know, for your particular application, what do you think is, is the most valuable to your business? Uh, this type of information is valuable to us to uh, know where we should concentrate our efforts because. At the end of the day, again, as technology suppliers, uh, for us, uh, we're only successful as far as uh, you as drone service providers are successful in a, you know, uh, delivering data to your customers' needs. So, uh, Okay, with that said, let's transition over to Forrest. Forrest, thanks for joining us. Hey, Mike, good afternoon, and, and thanks to everybody at Slant Range for uh, having me on today. I appreciate it. Audio good? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, this is a, uh, again, uh, a, a case study that we did down in South Texas that I think is very re relevant to, uh, to what the slant range capability is and how you really sit down and start to interact with a farming operation and uh, determining, as it says in the first bullet point, what does my client need? What's the pain point in their operation? And what tools do I have in my toolbox, specifically the slant range toolbox, that might help them uh, with those problems? And I think, you know, when you find out what the uh, pain point is in the operation or what the concern in is, whether that's a land issue, a disease issue, a pest issue, um, then you're delivering a lot more than just a pretty picture coming out of the sensor. Now you can really start to understand and tackle um, what their problems are, and then take the take that data and start generating a solution based off of understanding uh, what the problems are. I think we can go to the next slide. So we're down in South Texas, and and when I first sat down with this uh, with this group of farmers down there, and they've been farming in South Texas for a long, long time, second, third generation operation down there. Uh, one of the things they said to me is, "Forced, we have a field here that has got inorganic areas." In it. I said, "What do you mean by inorganic?" Well, back in the uh, 1930s and 1940s, when they uh, were drilling oil production onto uh, that piece of land. Uh, and being along the Gulf Coast, there's a lot of salt water that's a byproduct of the drilling. And at the time, way back then, all that salt water spilled onto the uh, onto the farm. Uh, there were no containment uh, uh, ponds or anything like that. It all spilled out. Well, as we all know, salt and, and, and organic soil don't mix very well. And so they ended up with these inorganic areas in this field. And that picture at the top there, you can see on the left-hand side, that's actually one of the pump jacks. Um, and then uh, the dead areas over on the right side in that field, Milo, where literally nothing will grow. I mean, forget Milo, there's no weeds, there's nothing that's going to grow there. So over the course of really since the 60s, um, they've been trying to rehab this land, couldn't really get it rehabbed at all. And so th the concept then was, well, we're just going to plant through it. We'll spray through it. Uh, we know we're losing money in those areas, but there's really nothing we can do about it. So, uh, and as you can see on that uh, inorganic area where the planter went through those particular areas on that Milo, there's just nothing there. You can see the wheel press tracks and there's, there's nothing there. So uh, I said, you know, like guys, I think we've got a, a solution here. And, uh, you know, Google Maps was of no help because, uh, it was the wrong time of year. I said, let's uh, let's uh, give this a shot with the slant range technology and see where we go. And then uh, my suggestion would be to build a variable rate application highlighting uh, these inorganic areas. I think we go to the, the next slide there. 
So what you're looking at is the southern half of this uh, field, and you can clearly see in there where those non-productive inorganic areas are. And again, it, it's basically the flow of the land. You know, water's going to go to the path of least resistance. That's what that salt water did. And uh, we did do the survey. Uh, and this would have been in uh, May of 2017. Um, Milo had been in the ground approximately two and a half, nearly three months. So had a good stand of it up and running. And we were really able to highlight uh, using the uh, stress map where the, not only the stressed areas were, but also the inorganic areas which show up as the, as the really gray areas on the field. And everybody's just real quick, everybody's attention is usually drawn to the, to the bottom left polka dot area. That's iron chlorosis. So an iron deficiency in that field that, uh, that they didn't uh, know about, which was just an added bonus. So in working with uh, the stress map and then sitting down with the farmers, uh, we were able to, to build using a farm management system. I, I personally use SMS, uh, a variable rate prescription map uh, for this field. Um, so in, in essence, it was a very simple variable rate uh, if it's a dead area, turn the implement off, whether it's the sprayer or the planter. If it's a organic or growing area, turn it on at the specific rate. Now, I, I'm not an uh, agronomist. I'm not a crop consultant. Um, I know a lot of y'all work with agro uh, uh, agronomists and crop consultants. Um, this was very, let me just say this, is very much a collaborative effort with the with the farmers in terms of application rates and in terms of uh, planning rates and what they wanted to do in these particular areas so i let them guide me on that and even the day of uh the day of spring and day of planning we had some last minute changes we wanted to make or they wanted to make in the prescription process so um that's just i think an, an important thing to remember is it's a very much a collaborative process if you're not working with an agronomist or a crop consultant, you're working straight with um, the farmers. So the next map that just came up there is the as-applied um, data that came directly out of the sprayer. And this was your typical John Deere high boy green sprayer with a 120 foot boom on there. Um, and you can see when you compare to the uh, slant range data above, that it mapped it out uh, pretty gosh darn accurately through there. Now it, it's not step per step, you know, per step uh, matching. Uh, there are some custom things that we did when we sat down with the farmers in terms of carving out uh, a couple of more areas that that they deemed just that non-productive, even though there was some reflectivity there. And uh, again, it goes back to that uh, uh, cooperative process and. Uh, then it was a matter of when it was time to spray, uh, meeting down at that field and uh, uh, delivering the prescription map uh, to the sprayer. Now, one word that I would throw in on this is the first time you do this, if you're working with a group that is not variable rate um, savvy yet, I mean, maybe they have it like my group did. They had the technology. They just had not begun to use it. I would highly recommend having either your, your John Deere or your case or whatever uh, color equipment they have rep there with you to help you walk through uploading that prescription map into the monitor uh, on the tractor or on the sprayer. There's some great videos out there on YouTube that show you how to do it, but there's a couple of nuances. And I have found uh, that having that local rep with you the first time really helps out in terms of getting that up, uh, uploaded and ready to go. So bottom line, here's, here's what we did. We were able to identify 32 non-productive acres in that 190 acre field. Um, we took the gallons applied last year uh, in 2017 uh, in terms of uh, their spray application, and this was a this was a combination fertilizer and herbicide application, and the herbicides were broadleaf and grass, we were a little pressed for time due to weather issues. And we calculated at 30 gallons per acre, which was the applied rate, a total gallon savings of 1,035 gallons just on that one pass. And the total cost uh, 
uh, for that spray per acre and between the fertilizer and the atrazine and the outlet was $51.67. So that's where that savings of $51.67 an acre comes. And if you divide 1,035 by 30 gallons per acre times the 5167, that's where the $1,783 in savings comes. And that is bottom line savings right there. That's straight to the bottom line. That's money not spent, money in the pocket. And um, I think as we all know in farming, how, how important that is given the current state of commodity prices uh, that most of our folks are dealing with. Uh, whether it be corn, cotton, wheat, uh, what have you, beans out there. So uh, as the important thing is, that prescription map uh, can be used throughout the season. Uh, if they're going to go in and do a burn down prior to harvest, uh, I could take that same prescription map. They can tell me what gallons per acre they want to apply. I'll make that, send it down to them, easy to upload into their Green Star monitor, just using a thumb drive. Um, I think the real important thing, you know, that that, that that one savings was impressive, but but what these guys are really excited about is this is going to give them next year the first opportunity they have had in nearly 40 years to put cotton back into that field. Um, cotton in South Texas is a very input intensive uh, crop to grow given the climate down there. Uh, the amount of uh, rain and the, and the high humidities and temperatures. Uh, and it just hasn't been economical for them to put cotton in there, uh, given how many passes they have to make over the field throughout the course of growing season. So uh, they, they are estimating potentially a gross gain of about $480 an acre uh, in that 190 acres. Uh, that's a return over what the Milo return would be. Uh, moving forward uh, in 2019. So we're very excited about that. They're excited about it. And, uh, you know, I think it's a really, really good feeling uh, for those of us that are in agriculture when you can go to a, to a, to a farming company or a farmer and, and be able to deliver that kind of return on investment for them. Um, and, and I know they, they really uh, appreciate that. The effort that we so, put in that in the collaborative process. So, Forrest, that that uh, you know, that's a great story. I you know, when we first heard it, we thought this would be great to share with everybody. Um, you know, this is just one example in in one crop type. It's it's probably uh, you know relatively common in in that particular area, but I think it illustrates the the important process here that you used, which is to really sit down with the grower and understand you know what is their problem. Um, you know. Our, the technology doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, look for uh, high salt content soil, but what you're able to do is, you know, figure out what elements of the technology might be applied to this particular problem and kind of bridge that gap between what, what we're able to do as technology suppliers and ultimately what the grower needs. And I think that's where success is found uh, for you and yes. for others. And that's, yes. that's the type of thing I want to share with everybody. So. Anyway, we're, we're approaching the end of our half hour here, um, and before we hang up, we wanted to open up to any a couple of quick questions if we can. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, so let's see if we have any questions. Sure. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, before I launch into those, I just wanted to share the results from our second poll question. Um, that was the, which data type is most valuable to your business? Looks like most of you said nutrient stress, uh, closely followed by NDVI, and then uh, pest conditions and yield potential. And with that, uh, we, ha we do have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, do you have an example regarding the wine and grape industry? We do. We have a number of clients that are working uh, a lot uh, in, in wine and grapes, both in California, also in uh, regions of Australia in particular. Um, again, uh, some of the best uh, examples that we find, we find that talking directly uh, to, to those other service providers, they're the ones uh, working with directly with the growers. Um, and generally speaking, if you're working in a crop type, we might be able to connect you with somebody else uh, who's working in another area that would not be competitive with your business, but could maybe share some best practices. And I think um, in some of the online communities, you'll be a good place to find those types of people. But to answer your question, yes. 
there's, there's uh, this technology is being used quite a bit uh, in vineyards. Our second question is, uh, can you elaborate on signal training? So signal training is um, a technique that we developed. Um, what we recognize that is that it's it's extraordinarily difficult for for us as technology developers to try to create a customized solution to every problem that's out there. So what we built into the software was the capability for users to train the software to their own needs. And what this basically allows you to do is uh, isolate individual signals, whether there's uh, spatial or spectral signatures in the field. It's as simple as drawing a box around the item that you're interested in. Uh, and the software trains itself to look for that particular characteristic and then shows you in the rest of the field uh, where that particular characteristic is reappearing. It's been used to do uh, weed detection. Uh, we've used it in some of the examples I showed you earlier, you know, looking for lodging, uh, looking for uh, high uh, soil moisture content. Um, so there's a, there's a range of applications, but if you're interested in hearing more about that capability, feel free to get in touch with us. Our next question is that, is the signal training for soil moisture included in the software? Uh, yeah, it is. It, it's, it's included in our, in our pro package. If I upload I should say that all, all, one thing I'll add, Shayla, is that all the examples that I showed you before uh, are capabilities that are currently in the, in the package. It's, uh, it's a matter of um, us maybe showing you how, how to use it. All right, um, our next question. If I upload an orca mosaic of a flight at five meter height, can you count the spinach that is germinating one week after seeding? What cost would it have per hectare? That's a good question. Five meters is relatively low. I, I think we'd have to, we've done a lot of plant counting, um, cauliflower, lettuce, uh, corn, um, geez, there's a lot. But uh, to answer that specific one, we, we, we want to take a look at it. So. As far as cost goes, it doesn't. Uh, we don't charge at all on a per acre basis. Um, there's just the cost for, obviously, the drone and and the sensing device, uh, and then and then there's a an unlimited use license for processing software. So uh, you can process as much as you want, and it doesn't. Uh, the, the the cost is not affected by that. Um, but as far as I think was was spinach, um, it's something we'd have to look at uh, how what the planting density is in particular, and what the size of the plant is at the stage you want to count it. So uh, please get in touch with us on that one. Next question is, uh, do you have any information on working with potato growers? Yes, yeah, so we do have some uh, DSPs up in uh, kind of the, the Idaho region, uh, kind of in the, in the central western portion of the US, I think. Um, it's another one, uh, get in touch with us. Uh, they are working on uh, some specific, um, detecting some specific conditions in, in potato crops. Uh, and we've actually been working on adapting our, uh, that special signal detection capability for detecting a particular virus that's uh, present in, in potato fields. So if you're interested in that, again, uh, get, get in touch with us. Any experience on heat stress? I'm sorry, on, on heat stress? Yes. Um, <laughs> when we visit Costa Rica, it's awfully hot down there, and it, we get stressed out about that, I guess. But um, anyway, sorry. Uh, um, if you're looking at heat stress, I mean, there are a different class of sensors. Uh, you know, obviously, there's thermal sensors. And what you're also ultimately looking at, to some extent, is the hydration condition of the plants. Um, Spectral sensors in the visible and the near infrared, infrared bands have some capability to detect uh, the, uh, dehydration stress that might be a result of, uh, of heat. Um, but thermal cameras are, are a little bit more adept at doing that. However, the processing of thermal data is a bit complex. Um, so generally speaking, heat stress is something that it will appear as a stress condition, uh, but it's going to be up to correlating that with other factors, specifically what is the heat index uh, over the last couple of days to, to kind of attribute that stress condition to heat. Our next question is that, you mentioned that you have a process to maintain trust in the spectral data, especially during flight operations. Can you elaborate on the sensor calibration and the uh, QA, QC process for spectral data? Yeah, so um, one thing I, we, you know, this is, it gets into a little bit of a technical matter that, and there's, there's other material that we can reference if you're interested in learning more, but 
Um, when you're using a spectral sensor, whether it's just an RGB color camera or, or a narrowband multispectral system or even a hyperspectral system, recognize that the color of sunlight is evolving continuously, whether it's a sunny day, a cloudy day, uh, or change of season. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is estimate pigment concentrations in the plants based on uh, how much sunlight is absorbed uh, by, those, by those pigments. If the color of sunlight changes, um, you're going to get a different measurement unless you have some uh, method of correcting it. Traditionally, what is done is to uh, image just a what's called a calibration panel that's put on the ground. But technically, that's only valid for the one image that has the panel in it. Uh, we developed a new technology several years ago, which we've actually uh, had pat a, a couple of patents issued in the US on that puts an onboard calibration sensor onto the system. So every single frame of the multispectral device is automatically ca calibrated for changing sunlight conditions. And that enables uh, you to compare data over time. And that's, that's kind of a critical element to using the data to build any sort of models or, or things like that. Um, every sensor that we develop, develop and, and that we ship is individually calibrated um, against the sunlight standard. Uh, so those are calibrated before they ship and uh, they, don't, they don't really need to be uh, recalibrated uh, for that particular measurement uh, after they're delivered. On top of that, as far as in-flight data goes, uh, our new integration with DJI, uh, we, we announced a partnership with DJI uh, in late March. Um, our 3PX sensor system uh, has an integration with that particular aircraft that allows the operator to actually see sensor data uh, uh, on, on their hand controller while it's in flight to ensure that you're getting the data that you need and actually the, the calibration signals and the, basically the, the amount of sunlight you're getting uh, to the sensor is, is actually uh, apparent to you while, while the unit's in, in flight. And that, that all goes to improve reliability, to make sure you're getting the data you need. Our next question is one for Forrest. Why didn't the non-productive areas just show up as high stress? I'm sorry, why did the non-productive areas show up just as high stress? Yes. Okay, yeah, that, uh, it, it has to do with soil health in that particular area. Um, it just, it, it's just a bad part of soil. And you know, it all begins with the soil when you're out there. And, um, the non-productive areas were completely bare, if that's the question, completely bare. So you're not gonna get any reflectance in those. But then as we moved away from those out into the margins around there, where the soil composition of soil chemistry started to change, that's where you started to see more of those high stress areas. And so when we were mapping out the variable rate uh, prescription, we were able to kind of nibble around those areas and take more of those off as the, uh, as the the farmer saw fit in that project. Our next question, um, is tree counting possible with your population tool? Tree counting. Um, so the, the, the techniques that we've developed and we showed you here today are, are geared towards primarily row crops. Um, as far as counting trees, we are, um, that is a, you know, uh, orchards in general are important crops uh, for a lot of our, our customers and we are actively working on a capability uh, that we will plan to release uh, in the coming months that speaks directly to tools that will be applied in orchards. For our next question, do you offer training on how to use plant feed? Yes, we do. Um, uh, we provide, I mean, there's, there's online videos, there's a user manual, but I think the most effective thing is we do provide uh, kind of one-on-one uh, -on -one training, whether you want to actually visit us here in San Diego uh, or online. Uh, we, we do one-on-one -on -one training or uh, one uh, with, with your team, um, and I think that's the most effective thing. And ultimately, like uh, to, to, to force example, uh, a lot of times success comes down to really understanding how the technology works. Uh, so you can make that leap to figuring out how to apply it to a problem. So we, we do recommend that. The next question is another one for Forrest. How did you get the slant range data into your SMS? Hey, great question. Um, slant view exports as a shapefile, uh, and the shapefile really is the key to going into any of the variety of SMS systems that are out there, not SMS, but farm management systems that are out there. So, um, and I'll compliment Slant Range here. They have done a really, really good job in developing the shapefile and really lightening the load of that shapefile in terms of size. 
And uh, I can tell you as an SMS user, it flows seamlessly out of slant range uh, as a shape file and then into uh, SMS without a problem. Uh, for our next question, I own a three-piece sensor but having issues to plant count. How can I solve that? Sorry, having issues to do what? Uh, having issues to plant count. Oh, plant count. So plant counting, um, it has to be done. Well, first of all, there's a critical uh, phase of development when it needs to be done. Uh, for corn, that's typically V2, V3, uh, and there has to be relatively good separation between individual plants. So ultimately, I mean, I'll, the, the algorithm is segmenting individual plants, but if they're overlapping, so if you're a little late in development, once you get to V4 or later, it's a little too late to do, to do the counting. Um, the other thing is you have to fly at the right altitude. So ultimately, we need to get a certain number of pixels on each plant to recognize it as a corn plant. Uh, so the altitude you fly at, the speed you fly at are critical. Um, but if you fly it at the right window uh, of growth, at the right altitude and the right flight speed, uh, we typically see uh, errors that are less than 5%. Um, and if you're not seeing that, please give us a call and we can give you a number of pointers. Uh, for the next one, you didn't mention anything specific about the 3PX. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the advantages over the 3P and other sensors? Yeah, I, I, I did mention the 3PX uh, briefly. Um, so the 3PX is the one that uh, we, we developed uh, with the partnership with DJI, which is, uh, it's basically integrated um, with, the, with the drone much more tightly than our, the 3P sensor is. So from an imaging, from a data products point of view, you're gonna get the same products out of the 3P or the 3PX. The advantage of the 3PX is um, it's just a tighter integration with the aircraft. It's an easy on, easy off mount onto the regular gimbal mount for the, for the uh, M200 series. You can actually use the 3PX on, on the Inspire and the M100 as well, uh, or the M600, sorry. Um, but uh, with the M200 series, uh, there's actually flight data coming down from the sensor to your hand controller. So you'll see, uh, you can see footprints on the ground where your images are taken. Uh, you can see a number of images uh, taken. You can see uh, basically health status information. So uh, it just makes uh, operations a lot more efficient, but from a data point of view, they're the same. For our next question, uh, do you have any examples of working in the almond industry? Yes, we, uh, well, almonds are, are a large crop here in California where we're based. And uh, as I mentioned, um, not just in almonds, but in other orchard crops, uh, we have a number of customers working uh, within uh, in citrus and almonds, pistachios in California, uh, uh, in Florida, in Australia in particular. Um, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we, we are working on some uh, unique capabilities for orchard crops. Um, and if you're interested in what we have done with Almond uh, to date, give us a call and we can share some, some more details. But um, again, uh, we, we have a more specialized orchard tools coming up in the coming months. Do you have any experience on oil palm? Oil palm is actually a relatively, uh, we do have some, some DSPs in Latin America in particular that uh, have a lot of experience with oil palm. Um, I think in Colombia, uh, we have uh, one of our DSP partners who's also a distributor based in Panama City is working in oil palm. Uh, and again, a lot of these questions that are specific to different crop applications, uh, we're happy to answer the questions we can, but in many cases, we'd like to put you in touch with uh, others that are using the technology in those applications. Do you have any plans for a standalone app or suite for the Crystal Sky Monitor? We are continuing to uh, explore tighter integration um, uh, with along along those entire lines with with uh, with, with DJI, um, and I'll just say that you know we're we're working on deeper integration, and we'll we'll have some announcements when uh, when they're ready. Can the three PX be uh, integrated or used with any other type of drone or controller? Sure. So. Um, you don't necessarily have to use a 3PX on board uh, a DJI M200 series. As I mentioned, you can use it on the Inspire or the, uh, the M600 and uh, uses the same mount. You can get uh, power through that interface. However, if you use it on another drone, um, you're not going to get those advantages of the power and the data interface. So 
Uh, you can still collect data with it, um, uh, but from that point of view, a 3P might be uh, you know, a more cost-effective solution if you're using a drone package. Our next question is another one for Forrest. You stated that you use multispectral and RGB. Were the maps straightforward NDVI or NDRE or other bands used? No, we used uh, strictly the NDVI out of slant range for that for that map that we showed you. Um, you could have used the RGB, uh, but uh, we felt like in cooperation with with the growers as we were going through the data that the slant range uh, stress map, which is the NDVI. Um, gave us the best results and is what we needed to work off of going forward on that. All right. Um, for our next question, is it possible to detect and measure plant line failures in sugarcane crops? That's a good question, and I'm not sure if I know the answer to that one. Um, I, I and I do know that we have customers working in sugarcane, and again, another wow. another example of where uh, it might be best to put Stu in touch with some of the people that are using uh, our systems in sugarcane. Uh, for our next question, how much do you see your drone service providers charging for their services? It's really it's kind of all over the place. It depends, um, and it's probably a better question for Forrest. But what we've what we've seen is it really depends on the crop you're operating in. What it comes down to is how how uh, how valuable is the problem you're solving. Um, you know, ultimately the value of the the data comes down to that question. Well, and and I also think, Mike, it depends on what part of the country you're in and what crop you're flying in, and potentially yep. even with the commodity prices at at that particular point in the year. Um, I you know I've seen it done everywhere from uh, a cost per acre. Uh, with a declining cost as the acreage increases to package deals for multiple flights through the, throughout the growing season. And then back to Mike's point, you know, what is it you're actually trying to accomplish? Uh, and, and sometimes those are the one-off projects as well that, uh, that fall into that special uh, area. So um, you just got to understand what's going on out there, what the, what the current needs are, and, and what the market's going to bear but there's several different models to work off of. Our next question is that, what new maps are you working on and how soon will they be available? Um, I'll just say that we're working on some, some more, uh, some capabilities that are customized to, to some specific crop applications that would see uh, particularly high demand around. Um, let me just say that uh, uh, the tools that we put into our systems, uh, you know, there's a, a balance you need to strike between being flexible enough to be used in multiple crops and uh, if you make them more specific to some crop applications you can be more effective with those so um, I'll just say that we you know honor some some uh, specific applications to uh, some high value problems that we see pretty commonly um, and we'll have some announcements on those in the you know, towards uh, throughout the summer and into the fall you mentioned your tight integration with the DJI aircraft. Is there or will there be any similar integrations with the bird's eye view Firefly 6? Yeah, we've had, we've had um, customers have fantastic success with, with the Firefly um, and the bird's eye view team, um, particularly in areas that have, you know, a requirement is large area coverage. And it's out of the scope of this conversation, but, you know, fixed wing to, uh, Rotary rotary lift uh, aircraft is a, is a whole debate, and uh, the Firefly 6 is a great uh, balance between those uh, capabilities. We do have um, uh, an integration with the Firefly 6, and we have customers using them, uh, and we have actually distributors who are, are selling the integrated package, and, and we'd be happy to put you in touch with them if you're interested. Great. Um, our next question is another one for Forrest. What was the rough timeline from collecting the slant range data to making the variable rate application? Hey, yeah, great, great question. So the thing to keep in mind that that sometimes what we do as drone service providers takes a little bit of time. I mean, we're dealing with growing seasons. Uh, we're dealing with uh, growers that are often very, very busy and have a number of competing interests uh, around the farm. So uh, again, just a timeline on this particular project. 
is the crop that Milo went into the ground roughly uh, in March. We flew it in May. Um, started, you know, looking at the results soon thereafter, and then um, working through the fall in developing the because we had to go through. When I say working in the fall, keep in mind that that this is a multi-crop grower down there. So by by this time last year, they're harvesting uh, the Milo. Then we're running straight into cotton after that. Then we're running into fall field work. So it was really into the fall when uh, we were able to sit down and start mapping out the variable rate uh, information, finalized it uh, in February, and then put it into play in March with the fertilizer herbicide application, and then about a week later on the planning prescription. So it's, it, I think it's important to know that some of the decisions you make and some of the data you collect, it, it's a multi-year process on, on getting this done, especially depending on the crop rotation. Some of the Milo I flew down there last year uh, that we're going to develop planning prescriptions for won't be used until 2019 just due to crop rotation. Uh -huh. Our next question is another one for you, Forrest. Uh, what plant range sensor do you use? I have got a 2P right now. And uh, it's a workhorse and no problems with it. Yeah, I've got it mounted on an M100 and uh, I don't know how many thousands of miles it's flown, but uh, it, has, it has worked really, really well for us. Um, so how do you manage, oh, pardon, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was gonna jump in and say we're, we're well past the half hour and then I'm happy to continue answering questions, but um, uh, as long as we, if we, have, we have questions, I can keep going, but up, up to you. Sure. Yeah, there's still uh, plenty of questions to go through, so I guess it's up to you guys whenever we want to call it and answer the questions uh, separately. So for our next one is, uh, how do you manage to compare vegetation indices through the time without radiometric calibrated images? Um, so that's well. That's a good question. I mean, uh, the way our system operates, there's a there's a calibrated measurement uh, for every every single image. So that's that's really not um, not really an issue. Um, so I you know I I guess if if in the circumstances that the sensor failed, uh, I think maybe that's the question. Um, but again, I, that's uh, that's not a failure that we've seen. Um, generally speaking, if if you're you know if you're using another sensor system that doesn't you know uh, you have gaps between available measurements, uh, you'd have to interpolate that, um, uh, and that can be complex, especially if you're dealing in partly cloudy situations. So let's do two more. All right, two more questions. Um, do you recommend drone deploy for mission planning, and can it be used for image image processing? As uh, person also mentioned. We have uh, DJI Matrice and two, 200 and 210 platforms. Yeah, we, have a, um, we do have an integration with Drone Deploy, and we have a lot of customers that are, are using Drone Deploy as their, as their flight planning software. Um, and something maybe we don't, we don't promote enough, but if you, know, if you want to take the, the images from our sensor system and have them processed in Drone Deploy, you can do that and, and bypass uh, our processing methods. Um, and some people have applications and, and they do that and they're very happy with it. Um, and again, it's probably something we don't promote as much as, much as we should, but that capability and integration does exist. Uh, one final note, uh, just before I ask the final question of our panelists, um, a few people have been asking if uh, this webinar will be available for recap. And yes, it definitely will. We'll send out a link to the recorded version so you can go through and uh, listen to the answers at any time in the future. And uh, for our final question, is the M100 still a drone that your sensor can be installed? Or I'm sorry, M100 is still a drone that your sensor can be installed? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, our, our 3P sensor is probably the, um, the most commonly used sensor on, on board the M100 platform. So, And there's, there's forests. <laughs> Staffing to have it sitting on the table. All right, uh, that's all the questions we have time for today. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, thank you to Mike and Forrest for talking today. And I'll hey. let you guys wrap it up.
Yeah, hey, I again, thank you, Slant Ranks, for having me on. I appreciate it, Mike and, and Abe and Matt, uh, for the invite. It's great to talk to everybody. Um, I'd just like to say it, it, this, this is a growing, growing industry. There's lots of great stuff coming out. I talk to uh, Slant Range users literally all over the world now. So um, if you're interested in, in connecting, uh, we've got a contact page on our website, flyarrowinfo.com. Uh, just reach, us, uh, reach out to us there, or uh, Slant Range has got my information. I uh, look forward to speaking with you. Also uh, on Twitter at Fly Arrow Info, on Twitter at Fly Arrow Info, you can follow uh, what goes on there and uh, look forward to uh, watching this technology grow and evolve and, and we're on the right track here. Just stay with it, guys, and uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna succeed. Thanks, Forrest, uh, again, for your participation. I, th I thought uh, you've got, by the way, you've got plenty of uh, uh, great examples. That was just one uh, to share today. And, and like uh, Forrest said, Anybody uh, has questions, he's a, he's a great resource. Um, on top of that topic, uh, we have uh, similar conversations with a lot of our service partners, uh, and we're talking about getting people together in a centralized location to kind of share more of these discussions uh, live, face-to-face, -face, uh, and more on that coming. So, And then to Shayla, thanks again for, for hosting and coordinating. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. See you later, everybody.